Welcome and thank you for standing by. For the duration of today's conference, all parties will be in listen-only mode until the question and answer session of the conference. At that time, you may press star 1 on your phone to ask a question. I would like to inform all parties that today's conference is being recorded for transcription purposes. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to hand the conference over to Erlene Dowell. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you, Tara. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our August LED webinar. On behalf of the U.S. Census Bureau and the Local Employment Dynamics Partnership, in collaboration with the Council for Community and Economic Research and the Labor Market Information Institute, it is my pleasure to welcome another one of our esteemed speakers from the 2021 LED Virtual Workshop, Curtis Askew, as he presents Minding Our P's and Q's Using Load Data to Explore the Impact of the CARES Act Pandemic Relief Program. Early scholarship on pandemic relief programs created by the CARES Act were limited by a lack of geogra geographic specificity and by a tendency to narrowly define impact. Using 13 million address level geocoded transactions linked to the LEHD origin destination employment statistics or loads data, this presentation illustrates how increased granularity not only provides a more nuanced interpretation of impact, but more actionable information for local decision makers. Curtis Askew is the president of the principal consultants of Data Engine Consulting, LLC, a company specializing in data analysis, program evaluation, and strategic planning. Prior to founding Data Engine in 2008, Mr. Askew was a research assistant professorship at Clemson University. He is experienced in qualitative, quantitative, and geospatial methods and has integrated all three into a unique mixed method approach for the Jack and Jill of America, Incorporated the South Carolina Department of Commerce, and South Carolina Works Greenville. He has also pursued policy work around broadband accessibility as an evaluator and research associate for the Joint Center for Economic and Political Studies, a reader for the Office of Minority Affairs, U.S. Department of Commerce, and the principal author of a white paper that led to South Carolina's High School Equivalency Accessibility Act which offers an alternative to the GED. Mr. Askew is a retired Air Force officer who lives in Greer, South Carolina. Without further ado, I welcome Curtis Askew. Thank you, Ms. Dow. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, I hope to at least uh, whet your appetite for a unique data set. Um, that is available yet has received very little um, consideration since it is in place in the public domain, and that's the Payroll Protection um, Transaction Database. Um, for those of you who are wondering about the title, Minding Our P's and Q's, um, please let me uh, at least take a few seconds before diving in to explain that the idea of P's and Q's um, actually originated, at least one of the explanations, is that the idea of uh, P's and Q's originated as a discussion about the difficulty to distinguish between the P and the Q in lowercase format. Um, of course, as, as you know, if you put them in uppercase, if you capitalize them, they are very easily distinguished. But here in this presentation, I am drawing on the sort of metaphor of P's and Q's um, to link the idea to the Payroll Protection Program, which is all P's, um, as well as the importance of the questions that PPP data can drive us to thinking about, um, particularly from the perspective of how the data uh, decision makers are attempting to deal with the impact of COVID. So without further ado, let me just suggest um, where we're going to go and how we're going to get there. So the work that I'm going to present is really the result of a client, a workforce development board here in South Carolina, asking um, two really important questions. So I'm going to cover what those questions are. Then I'm going to provide a little bit of context for the questions that were asked by sort of delving into a little bit about the 
U.S. workforce development system and how it's structured, and then sort of move a little bit more granular to talking about a particular region in South Carolina. I'll then move into a discussion, brief discussion of the data, um, how the data was approached, and then provide um, some of the sort of detailing that was derived from the work that was done. I'll then uh, follow up with three main takeaways and discuss um, next steps in terms of the work that has already been done and how within this particular region, um, which is the upstate Weola region, we have uh, decided to move with the data and utilizing some of the insights that we gave. So the principal questions that were addressed, um, or at least posed to me, um, as a contractor really revolved around, can you describe the transaction data that resulted from the CARES Act PPP program? Um, in the upstate Weola region, um, there were 18,000 payroll um, PPP loan transactions um, distributed across 14 counties. And my client wanted to know how are those dollars distributed and how many jobs um, were reported as being impacted? Refining that a little bit more um, through discussions, the conversation really sort of settled on how can loads data be used to understand the notion of impact within our particular workforce investment area. And I'll explain the sort of relationship between we owe a region versus WEAS. Um, a little bit later on. In driving sort of into that question, the question really revolved around how can what we know about the distribution of loans shape decision making within the particular workforce investment area, particularly um, at the time that this work was presented to me, there was a request by the state that all workforce investment areas in the state of South Carolina provide plans for how they would ultimately return back to work um, and continue to do the work that uh, workforce investment areas are, are tasked with doing. And then the question that came out of that was, how do you effectively communicate what is what the data is telling us to local stakeholders so that they, too, can be prepared in terms of how they deal? And this drives directly into um, the question of why it matters. At the end of the day, the work that these questions drive at really revolve around resiliency. Um, as I'll discuss um, in a few slides, the region of South Carolina that is called the Upstate Weora region um, is principally a manufacturing region. And at least from experience through the Great Recession, we understand or we understood that how you prepare information um, and understand information about disruption to the local labor market is either going to slow or hasten your recovery. Uh, more generically, this is called resilience. And one of the things that um, we learned through uh, the last um, labor market disruption was the more you have more information you have about what is going on in your local market, the better prepared you are in terms of programming that will get you to where you need to be. In this case, the, the goal would be to not only bounce back but to be able to establish yourself with a new normal. That being said, the upstate Weola region, and particularly the Green, Greenville Workforce Investment Area, which was my client, um, from the period of the sort of waning days of the Great Recession up until 2019, engaged in a series of efforts revolving around data. And having been a part of that, um, I was contracted to explore this PPP loan transaction data to see what additional information we could deal, um, derive um, moving for, for moving forward 
as we come out of uh, the impact of COVID. As most of you are aware, um, there are still significant labor market disruptions across multiple sectors and in a state like South Carolina that is particularly um, acute because the vast majority of our economy is generated through our manufacturing base. Um, we are, in fact, the home of state region, is the home of BMW North America, which um, ships most of the cars that BMW produces both internal to the United States as well as um, for the global market. Let me now turn to sort of the, con the context of the problem by explaining a little bit more about what workforce development boards actually do. So the U.S. workforce development system was established as a part of what was called the Wagner-Kaiser Act in 1933. The intent was to provide a national employment system to, in to connect, in essence, workers to jobs. And over the years, that act has undergone some significant changes um, with the most profound being um, the Workforce Investment Act of 1988, which created um, your workforce investment areas. Workforce investment areas are a partnership between states um, and the federal government where states divide their own counties up into specific workforce investment regions, each of which has a local board and a mandated board composition um, to ensure that federal dollars that flow for the purposes of workforce development are actually distributed and aligned with local interests. In 2014, the Wagner-Pizer Act um, was again amended and refined to mandate regional cooperation between individual workforce investment areas. Um, over the years, what had been learned was that some workforce investment areas within states were, in essence, not cooperating with neighboring workforce investment areas. So the uh, Workforce Innovation Act of 2014 substantively changed the way that um, workforce investment uh, areas had to structure their partnerships. And those partnerships were mandated through contracts with, that were signed and agreed to between individual workforce investment areas as well as uh, with the state board that governs how all we as within a state operate. In terms of what these development boards do, and how they operate their individual workforce investment areas, um, workforce development boards are responsible for the oversight of youth activities related to employment, training, and what some of you are aware of as the one-stop delivery system. Um, this is where folks who are unemployed go to get reconnected by filing for unemployment, um, updating their training if necessary, um, receiving subsequent support um, from the federal government for retraining going back to school um, and the like. There is also the sort of development and implementation of career pathways by aligning local systems in, in a way that issues are um, addressed locally and not necessarily at a higher level, either at the state or the federal level. Workforce development boards are also supposed to convene local stakeholders to assist in that process by creating plans and identifying um, additional resources to help with workforce development within their own workforce investment area. This involves engagement of employers and entities in the region itself um, to promote the broader um, goal of economic development and uh, finally, with the sort of um, way that these boards are structured, because they integrate with counties themselves and are funded, in essence, by individual counties on a chargeback um, system, they, the Workforce Development Board must develop 
uh, comprehensive local and regional plans in partnership with um, local county government. So I've talked a little bit, you know, laying out this foundation for what, what workforce development boards do. Um, it's important to understand the particular area um, that I was charged with dealing with, and that is primarily the Greenville Workforce Investment Area, which is located at the center um, here. It is a single county workforce investment area, which is a part of a larger wheel or region of 14 counties, and those 14 counties make up, in total, four workforce um, investment areas. Combined, this is called the upstate Weora region of South Carolina. So understand the Weora, WIAs, workforce investment areas, um, when combined, create a Weora region. And this is to force the cooperation, the regional cooperation, between workforce um, areas. In this case, Greenville has a contractual relationship with the Spartanburg Cherokee Union County uh, Workforce Investment Board. So it, it's important to really sort of think about from a regional perspective what the labor market looks like. So one of the things that I did was to take um, the origin and destination data from the LEHD to create this sort of labor flow chart so that you can understand the um, home to work flow of labor. And what you can see is that some counties like Greenville, which is a uh, client county for me, um, and Spartanburg, which is a neighboring county, they pretty much make up the majority of all the entire labor force within this 14 county region. Um, some counties have very small populations in terms of actual po total population, but also in terms of their employment base, which may or may not come from other areas. So for example, Abbeville, which is um, somewhat more rural, um, is only picking up 30 individuals uh, from Saluda and 50 from Pickens. At most, they are drawing uh, their secondary labor market supply from Greenwood County. So when we start looking at how the region's labor flows back and forth, you can understand the connectivity and why it would be important to understand the ways in which PPP transactions took place and were distributed across the region because, in essence, the entire region's labor market is tied together because people are driving from point A to point B um, and are not necessarily county bound. As I said earlier, the upstate Weora region is principally a manufacturing region, and you can discern this by looking at the location quotients by make sector um, categories. Um, even though Greenville, my client, is in a manufacturing region and, in fact, um, outside of one very rural county, McCormick has one of the lower ratings on manufacturing. What Greenville is known for is really its relationship as the center of a manufacturing region being the headquarters and transportation hub for what goes out of the upstate Weola region in terms of manufacturing. And that manufacturing is principally in the automotive sector um, because of BMW. In fact, we have an inland port which um, drives most of the state's um, economy in terms of exports because the inland port ships uh, vehicles directly from Greenville by rail to the Port of Charleston, and the Port of Charleston is currently the busiest port on the eastern seaboard. So with that background, um, let's talk a little bit now about the actual transaction data itself. Um, 
the CARES Act program created three distinct types of transaction data. Um, at the top, the one that most people know about is the Payroll Protection Program. Um, beyond that, there was an expansion of the Small Business Administration's Economic Impact Disaster Loan Program. And the distinction between the Payroll Protection and the Economic Impact Disaster Loan Program is principally that the Payroll Protection Program offered forgivable loans, whereas the Economic Impact Disaster Loan Program was principally a traditional loan program designed to deal with disruptions to the labor market, um, but it was made more robust under the CARES Act by expanding um, one particular one feature in particular, which was the advance that you could receive. So a business could apply for an economic impact disaster loan, and while waiting for that loan to be transaction to be processed, could receive an automatic ten thousand dollar advance, even if the application itself was not approved the uh, advance was allowed and then subsequently forgiven under the CARES Act. The idea of how we get to um, the data behind the transaction is a direct result of a series of lawsuits um, that involved the Small Business Administration, which did not want to release transaction-level data um, with any degree of specificity. In fact, the initial releases from the Small Business Administration revolved uh, around only providing summary data at the state level for the number of loans um, that were processed. Um, but there was no distribution, for example, of which banks were involved in the program or below the, um, below the state level where data was going. So what our project focused on was really for um, the initial tranche of data that was released um, was a set of data that was added in uh, additional detail given um, on data that was collected between April 29, 2020 and August 9, 2020. There have been subsequent releases of this data, but we principally looked at the 5.1 million transactions and then pulled South Carolina out of that um, so that we could get to the upstate we all reach. The data was inclusive of name, business name, address, um, characteristics of the applicant, an estimated number of workers, or in this case, self-reports of workers impacted, the loan amount, six-digit NAICS code, the lender, and the congressional district, which was the only um, sort of geographic aggregate besides the state and the zip code that were included in the data. It's important to note that um, there was a lot of missing data because it was not mandated as a part of the application process. Um, so what I will present on is principally um, some of these higher order pieces um, because with the amount of missing data, it would be very difficult to draw any sort of conclusions or even make uh, reasonable descriptions about um, what is happening in the data with so much missing data, particularly around um, the idea of the race of the applicant, um, their voter, uh, whether or not they were veteran status, um, male or female owned, most of that data was missing. In terms of what was done to the data, um, we undertook the task of point mapping uh, every valid business address located in the entire uh, PPP loan transaction data file set. Um, we then aggregated the data um, in one mile in a one mile square grid over the entire upstate region to be able to make sense out of the points. And I, I have an image at the end of this presentation that will show you what the point map looks like for the entire country. But from the standpoint of making decisions, that is far too granular. And what is what else is in the in terms of the other geographic identifiers? They are not granular enough. 
So we're looking for a sort of Goldilocks approach to uh, granularity. And the one mile square grid seemed to fit appropriately, um, particularly for what my client was interested in observing. Based on the aggregation uh, frequency for run on three key variables, loan amount, jobs reported as impacted, and two-digit NAICS codes. Um, going back to the original questions, these were the things that were most important to my client, so that is what we focused on. Um, in terms of how the data was dealt with, you know, the mapping within the uh, Greenville Workforce Investment Area, which is the second question that was posed, um, really was tied to the LEHD data, but we focused principally on the work area work area characteristic data because we wanted to understand what was going on relative to the employers, although there is another way to think about this, which is to look at the residence area characteristics and understand what was happening with the individuals who were likely impacted. Um, for our purpose, we selected the workforce, um, the WAT data to reduce the amount of noise um, when we're trying to identify, so which workers were impacted. We left the uh, subsequent residence area characteristic data for a different date because there's a little bit more complexity uh, to be looked at in terms of the assumptions made. We used the um, transaction data to identify principally where money went versus where it didn't go, because that was a, a, a major question, not just in the national discourse, but also locally. Um, we had a number of individuals who complained that because they did not have relationships with our local bankers, um, they were left out of the equation, and that subsequently led to an entire set of um, policies that resulted um, with dollars that came down uh, to, to the local county in terms of CARES Act transaction uh, or CARES Act money. So the sort of question that was posed to me to address was really about trying to get information to the county regarding the use of the data um, and what we could learn about subsequent policy program, uh, programs that was set up to ensure that those who did not get um, CARES Act tra uh, transactions process um, had a, quote, unquote, a second bite at the apple. So in terms of results, <clears throat> when we look at the distribution across the region, this is kind of uh, the, the breakout of the data. Um, and as you can see, the, the little blue squares are in fact um, the colored squares. Part of the one mile grid overlaid across the region and you can see um, the different workforce investment areas, um, Worklink, Greenville, the upstate, and upper Savannah. These are made up, as you can see, of individual counties um, with the greatest concentration just visually looking at it being within urbanized areas, but most assuredly um, centralizing within my client's workforce investment area and principally within the city of Greenville itself. Um, we'll delve a little bit more into um, some of these charts on the side, but I wanted to give you a sort of broad view of the distribution because the distribution itself is what my client was interested in understanding. Um, Greenville is considered urban, but relative to some of your major metros like a Chicago, a New York, or a Los Angeles, it is not nearly as dense in terms of population, but you can still see that there is an urban-rural dichotomy um, to be had in the ways that transaction data operated or, or transactions operated. There's a piece that we did not explore aggressively, but I did take some preliminary observations of, which is what was the footprint of the various banks that provided the loans and 
the distance between individuals who receive a loan and where the bank itself is located. Um, clearly, in rural areas, there are fewer banks, um, but it is noteworthy and something worth exploring how some of these sort of far-flung areas, um, which seem to be in the middle of nowhere, um, receive transactions. So when we look at the workforce investment areas within the upstate Weola region, it's very clear that Greenville County far outstripped, um, as you can see from the distribution on the previous slide, it far outstripped the other workforce investment areas in terms of the total number of loans, um, doubling in most cases. Um, and this is the sort of 18,000 transactions, 8,000 went to Greenville. Um, clearly showing the role of Greenville as a central um, business hub within a manufacturing region. When we look at it by two-digit two NAICS sector, it is important to note that um, the vast majority of dollars within the Greenville workforce investment area went to um, business services, um, which would make sense because you're talking about um, entities within the county that are primary employers for headquarters and transportation. And so there was a lot of stress placed on our local economy um, in terms of the number of people, the number of individuals who were employed within those sectors. And so we can see how the data breaks out. We can also see that there's quite a bit of um, variation in the way that monies were distributed compared to some of the other areas um, within the upstate Weola region, um, looking at it by next set. Now, I threw this in here because I, I wanted to highlight um, the sort of limits but also some of the perceptual understanding of the way that the PPP loan system um, operated. We know that at least in the food and accommodation sector, um, in across the region, um, heavy employer within this region, but the total number of um, unanswered <laughs> or the entire region, in this case, it's actually the, the state. Um, when we start looking at these, the, the data itself, the amount of unanswered data in terms of the um, racial background of the individual receiving the loan suggests that there was quite a bit of disparity, although because we have so many individuals who did not provide answers to the question, we are left kind of in the dark as to how is your, uh, how are loans actually distributed? Thinking about the impact of the PPP um, loans on different sectors within the Greenville wheel, which is the second question, um, one of the things that was done was we continued with the mapping um, using the one mile square grid but then overlay that with where jobs were concentrated. Um, so here in this particular piece, we look specifically at manufacturing. Um, and as I pointed out, while the Greenville Workforce Investment Area is a part, a significant part of the upstate workforce investment um, opportunity area, upstate Weoa. It is not a manufacturing town, it's a hub. Um, and what you can see is you have some areas of concentration in terms of the jobs in manufacturing per square mile, but you also um, see that we're kind of distributed across the entire state in terms of uh, entire region, in this case the county, in terms of where people are located and the ways that jobs are impacted. I should point out that this area here, um, just below the city of Greenville, is one of our major um, industrial sites. It's called Donaldson Center. 
Um, there are 131 businesses that deal in aerospace manufacturing um, that are located there. So that's why you see such um, sort of concentration in this area. There are a number of companies that um, cluster in this area, to, which is to the left of what is called um, 25, Highway 25. There are uh, several business parks located down this area. You can also see that across um, or up and down Interstate 385, you have a number of businesses that are clustered that were directly um, impacted in terms of uh, receiving PPP, PPP loans. We can see somewhat um, the same thing when we look at trade and transit, which um, fit Greenville very well as a logistics center and headquarters type town. You can see how the distribution of these jobs, which are pretty much dealing with higher education, um, tend to cluster on the right-hand side of the county and move over towards, um, and this is where I live, which is Greer. On the other side of Greer is where you find BMW. So there's a heavy tie going between um, Interstate 85, which flows over to BMW. Um, heavy concentration of businesses that are localized there. And again, you can see that there are some areas where you have um, heavy transportation-related jobs. Um, this area here in the center of the map is um, the city of Malden. Malden is not only home to a lot of individuals who work in the man, uh, manufacturing sector for trade on the trade and transit side, but also it happens to be an area where we have um, CUI car, um, which is one of our research centers um, for uh, manufacturing. This last one was included, this last slide was included because while it is not often discussed um, in terms of how Greenville presents itself, um, we are a destination location um, given our positioning between roughly halfway between Charlotte and Atlanta. Um, we are a destination location for um, lots of grandparents. Um, in fact, Greenville, because of our health system, um, is a great place economically for seniors to relocate to, and that has been a major um, growth sector for us is individuals with um, or above the age of 55. Indeed, 25% of the state seniors live in Greenville County. I wanted to point out the ways in which Healthcare is distributed across the country in terms of individuals who work. I also want to point out something that um, I'm aware of because I live here. There is an east or east-west dichotomy within our community, um, where you have uh, lots of low-wage workers who work as um, nurses, aides, and uh, medical assistants in areas that deal principally with seniors and the distribution of senior care. So as you well know that that has been COVID a similar, uh, in fact, a nationwide problem, um, the ways in which COVID was transmitted back and forth um, between your senior communities and some of your low wealth communities, and principally your low wealth communities in Greenville are on the western side of the state. So this was a great way to sort of illustrate um, for the executive director of the Workforce Investment Board that particular relationship um, because most of the people coming through the door who were immediately impacted by layoffs and the like were not necessarily your low-wage workers because healthcare workers are frontline workers. However, it would have an impact on other segments if these individuals were transporting back and forth infection. So this became a, a central part to the conversation that was going on within this particular workforce investment area. While that's very brief and sort of cursory, um, let me say that the takeaways 
um, in the conversations that I have with my client, there are really three big takeaways. The first is the PPP transaction data is truly unique. Um, I know of only one similar data set um, in the public domain, but that's uh, World War II uh, transaction data for um, enterprises that receive uh, federal loans. In the contemporary period, this type of data is generally not publicly available. You can purchase it, but it is not generally available. And in this case, the PPP not only tells us um, which businesses were distressed enough to seek out a loan, but also to provide this nominally some loan characteristic data or um, recipient characteristic data. We've got specific business addresses, loan amounts, and a six-digit NAICS classification, which allows you to be very, very granular about the specific industry segment within your larger two-digit NAICS classification. It also allows, um, as some of the previous slides show, how you can unpack a local labor market if you do the work of first geocoding the data and then aggregating it to whatever level or unit of analysis is most appropriate. Um, I can tell you that some of the additional data that was done to communicate to our local elected officials was to tie the data directly to um, county council boundaries since county council members were the ones making the decisions about subsequent CARES Act policy and uh, fund distribution. All that being said, it is important to understand you can't simply just utilize the PPP without a tremendous amount of computing power. Um, there is a lot of transaction data, not just as I pointed out with the PPP, but you've also got the EIDL and the EIDL Advance. If you combine all of that, um, there's a total of 13 million transactions. Um, it took me quite a bit of time using a very powerful machine to geocode all of that data. And for those of you who do not have an API um, that allows you to geocode, you will recognize that geocoding that much data can be quite costly. Um, however, once you, are, you have the data geocoded, you can aggregate it in ways that make the data useful, particularly in terms of place-based impact. Um, if we wanted to look very specifically at a neighborhood, because the data is geocoded, we could look at specific neighborhoods and determine how a neighborhood itself is impacted, which is something that we often don't have the ability to do, and certainly not with data that is this fresh, which is one of the limits of LEHD data. In terms of next steps, um, the next steps primarily are focused on extending the analysis and utilizing, as I pointed out, RAC data as well as origin destination data to draw out more of this sort of place-based um, understanding of the impact. There's also the goal of adding in the EIDL and EIDL advanced data um, because impact, which is often discussed in isolation of these other two uh, funding sources, really is incomplete because you're talking about a total flow of money that is impact going into a particular area. And in this case, we're talking about um, within a WIOA region, you're talking about tens of millions of dollars going into an area. The question is, where did it go within that area, and how can we then think about what that means overall? There's also uh, refining of the metrics. Um, I recognize very clearly that um, mapping alone is purely descriptive, and while it can provide some interesting ways to think about the data, um, the metrics themselves need um, a little bit more refining. So there's a question of whether or not you weight um, some of the programmatic variables themselves, loan amount, jobs impacted, or comparability. Um, 
spatial auto correlation comes into mind as I think about that. Um, businesses will, in fact, aggregate within small geographies. Um, there's the exploration of when money was received, and there's also whether or not we can mix in estimates from other data, uh, which would mean that you could look at something like the ACS PUMS and create small area estimates based on PUMS data that would allow you to extend the analysis. Um, as I already pointed out, there's the systematic assessment of industries themselves at the six-digit NAICS level. And one that is particularly um, interesting to me is the idea of funding deserts, which is an open question um, within the existing literature on um, the entire process and policy surrounding the CARES Act um, programming. Specifically, where did funding, federal funding go um, pre-COVID, and then how much of that had an impact on where money went during COVID? Um, and what role did specific banks play? Um, I've done some preliminary analyses, and um, it is ironic that some banks that participated um, were even issuing loans to individuals who were not within their geographic footprint. Um, so while that requires a little bit more research, I think it is interesting enough um, to know that there are exemplars where you have individual banks that are providing very large loans to individuals not in their footprint that speak to the social capital component to how funding uh, flows during and even before uh, the impact of COVID. And again, as I pointed out, the goal is to move beyond descriptive statistics and get into um, some more of the uh, more inferential statistics so that we can learn more about the ways in which um, funding and resiliency are tied together, particularly from a workforce development standpoint. As promised, this is the map of the 13 million PPP loan transactions um, as they were distributed across the country. Um, it's an interesting map, and you can see some of the sort of urbanized, the urban world dichotomy. Um, it is worth noting also that if you aggregate this data to the other workforce investment areas around the country, you also see some interesting patterns. Um, this is important to understand because, for example, in Texas, we have the, uh, the triangle area. You can see that these localized economies have an impact on the rest of the country. And we need to be able to understand that to understand um, why we have some of the problems that are transpiring within the economy currently, particularly around the idea of uh, not having enough workers. Um, the question becomes, for me, which types of workers are you lacking and how was a particular sector impacted truly by COVID other than the sort of cursory arguments that most of us read in the press? I am done. Um, <clears throat> I hope that I have presented you with some at least intriguing ideas around the idea of the PPT and raised intentionally more questions than those that I have answered, um, because that is, in fact, the whole reason for the presentation itself. It's more about the Qs than it was about the Ps. All right. Um, so are we ready for some questions? Absolutely. Okay, great. Tara, um, we're ready for questions. Thank you. We will now begin the question answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your phone and record your name clearly. I do need your name in order to introduce your question. If you choose to withdraw your question, please press star 2. Again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. It will take a few moments for questions to come through. Please stand by. So while we wait for the questions to queue up on the phone, I'd like to remind everyone to please be courteous and keep your questions pertaining to the presentation with one follow-up question. We received a few questions regarding the presentation, which will be accessible on the Census Academy website, 
in a week or two at census.gov slash academy under the webinar tab. Also, an evaluation will be mailed to you following this webinar. We would appreciate if you took the time to fill this short, short survey out so that we may better serve you. So, operator, are there any calls on the, at this time? I do not see any calls at this time, but as a reminder, please press star 1 if you would like to ask a question. Okay, thank you, Tara. So we did receive some questions in the chat. Uh, we have a question, from, and he he is asking, EIDL advances were initially based on 1,000 per employee up to 10,000. So I guess that's more of a comment. Um, yes, that is. Yes, that's, that's accurate. And what we saw in the data was exactly that. We saw that um, there were EIDL, EIDL advances that were issued, um, and the idea of capping at 10,000 is part of what I mentioned. Um, I did not mention that it was per employee, so that is um, taken, well taken. Okay, great. Uh, this question says, is this transaction data available during the period you mentioned for California, Arizona, Hawaii, or Nevada? How would one request it? Yes, the EID, uh, all of the transaction data is available um, for download from the Small Business Administration website. Um, because the program has closed out, we now have data for the entire run of the program. If you remember, the data that I um, presented on was just through August of 2020. Um, of course, the program just ended here uh, this past May. So we have complete transaction data from the inception of the program um, up through the end of the program for every state in the U.S and it can be downloaded um, free of charge, I just recommend that you have a really good high-speed Internet connection. Okay, this question says, I am not picking up transportation as one of the highest. Perhaps we can revisit at the end. I saw retail and health sectors as highest after business services, unless I am misreading the chart. Right, okay, so let, let's, let's be clear about labeling. Um, in the, um, the ways in which BLS identifies some of their NAICS categories, transit and transportation, um, you'll find, for example, in Greenville, this is where you find your um, material handlers. Most of you know them as forklift drivers, but that's not what we call them in South Carolina. Um, Transportation is not necessarily about buses and trains. It is also about the movement of goods. And so the aggregate in Greenville is that we are not a um, we are not a manufacturing town. We are a hub of a manufacturing region. So our numbers tend to reflect the national location quotients across most categories, except for professional and business services, which is um, an indicator of our headquarters um, for business type status uh, as a community. Okay. Um, Tara, are there any questions on the phone? There are no questions on the phone at this time. Great. Thank you. So here is another question. Will we be discussing how to find similar data for our area? That's what I was hoping to learn. Yes. Um, I, I think at, at the end of the day, one, one reason to sort of make people aware that this data exists is that it has not been discussed despite a very robust um, literature on the efficacy of the federal government weighing in. As I pointed out, we can download the data um, as a CSV file directly from a drive on the Small Business Administration 
um, website. If, in fact, you go to the Small Business Administration, you can download the transaction data um, directly. Um, so I can provide, if I, I apologize, I don't have the website address, but if you go to sba.gov and type in transaction data, it should take you directly to a link which will give you access um, to the files. Be forewarned, however, the files are very large and they are, in fact, cumbersome to deal with. Um, but you can deal with the files if you bring them into a database. You can extract out um, smaller chunks for analysis. I happen to have a very large machine capable of eating lots of data. So I simply have created very large files and processed the large files at once. For the geocoding, however, um, I will confess that not even my machine um, was capable of processing more than one census um, division at a time. And, you know, what we're talking about there is literally in the range of a million or so transactions per region, or I'm sorry, per division. Okay, now that, this question. I hope that helps. This question, how were parent subsidiary issues resolved in terms of locating loan recipients and associated jobs? Is the PPP data all reported at the establishment, uh, parentheses, worksite, parentheses, level? Yes, the, the note at the very beginning, I pointed out usable addresses. Um, the only data that was provide that applicants were required to provide was the address of the establishment. Now, I think that there is a really key point to be raised about whether or not the addresses provided are in fact valid addresses. Um, I did note that there are some PO boxes located in data, which is a little odd to me. Um, or receiving a loan and only being able to provide a PO box. So I only geocoded hard addresses. There was no verification done as to whether or not that hard address was the actual establishment location. Um, that would require a little bit more work. I can say that for the Greenville Workforce Investment Area, <clears throat> we do have a database. Um, because of uh, the Workforce Investment Board has access to that data, we could cross-reference business addresses, and in fact, if the name did not match to the address registered to the state, we could alter the name and run our analyses that way. Okay. Um, Tara, are there any more questions on the line? There are no questions on the phone at this time, but if you would like to ask a question, please press star one. Okay, thank you. Um, this is from, and he says, I'm interested in using this data for ESG and employment diversity improvement. Any tips? Thanks for the great presentation. Um, I, I think um, for me, the real sort of element that can be sort of drawn out of the data will be to tie it to the origin to destination data, um, which we did not use here. Um, and I argue for the use of the origin to destination data in large part because we have no way to disaggregate whether an individual employer um, employs large numbers of minorities, women, young people. However, we could in fact tie the location of the business and the origin of destination data to estimate um, what the composition of a employer would look like. Because remember, in the um, origin of destination data, we have a way to look at not only the sector, so we can narrow it down so that we're not sort of getting a bunch of noise in the data. But be careful. 
it is always going to be an estimate because we do not have disaggregated um, employment um, data from the PPP uh, data itself. We can only take a guess as to the location of business A, and it could be sitting adjacent to another business that does exactly the same thing. So you're going to get that type of noise. And I'm not sure if that really answers the question, um, but that is the, the avenue that I want to pursue. Um, tying it to local data um, is going to be most helpful. And this is where being able to dig into some of these other data sets that are out there that provide a profile of employers. There's local knowledge that can be added in in terms of employers. I would be very sort of focused on taking a very granular place-based approach um, and not try to bite off too much because you end up adding too much noise. This question, are there any grants to help business educate society with webinars on gut health and boosting natural immunity and natural antivirals? I don't know how to answer that question. Um, that goes a little afield of the, I believe, the presentation itself. Um, however, in, in my line of work, I do know that there are um, any number of programs out there, um, depending on the classification of the business. Um, if it's a small business, and keep in mind the definition of small business goes all the way up to 499 individuals. So um, we can think through that is a female um, owned and operated business. There are um, certainly SBA help there. Is it a minority, 51% minority owned business? There's SBA assistance there. Um, and of course, there are some other air avenues that can be pursued, not necessarily federal, to assist um, businesses that operate within the context of what is important to a local economy. And this is where this data may tie back in, is to help <clears throat> sort of understand the avenues of distress that opened up as a result of COVID. Um, so there's that way to think about utilizing this data to help address the question that was, as it was presented. And our final question from the chat, can you clarify if the dollar amount in the PPP transaction data represents actual loan dollars received or just loan dollars approved? My understanding of the um, what was reported is that the loan amount that is approved is the loan amount that was received. Um, to the extent that an agreement, that the transaction represents a um, federally backed loan, the monies that were received, and remember PPP is about uh, loan forgiveness, a discrepancy between what was approved and what was received um, would in fact open a business up to a whole host of liability issues as well as the individual bank itself that um, back the, the initial loan um, to be forgiven. In fact, it would be fraud. Okay. So are there any more questions on, or are there any questions on the phone, Tara? There are no questions on the phone. Thank you, Tara. All right, well, that concludes our webinar. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon, and thank you to Curtis for his wonderful presentation. Next month, in addition to our monthly September webinar, there will be a bonus LED webinar. The LED webinar series will continue again on September 1st, uh, 2021, at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time when Jeff Rosenthal presents recent cross-county commuting patterns. The presentation will focus on whether workers work and live in the same county, how that relationship changed over time, 
and the confluence of labor markets and commuting patterns. Then be sure to join us at our regular scheduled time on September 15, 2021 at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time when Taylor Marr presents Job Opportunity Tool, uh, which gives a rating from zero to 100 that measures the number of jobs within a 30-minute carefree commute from a given address. So thank you everyone for spending your time uh, with us this afternoon, and I hope that everyone has a great day.